We're pleased this morning to have two terrific faculty members from um, Stanford um, who are really dedicating their lives to further understanding the basic pathogenesis of autoimmune disease, looking at new technologies for diagnosis and bringing those to uh, the therapeutic uh, milieu. And they include two of our star physician scientists, um, Dr. Mark Genefes and Bill Robinson, um, each trained um, as physician scientists, meaning that they have long backgrounds in clinical training, but also laboratory-based research um, that have enabled them to work at the interface between the laboratory and uh, the, and the serving of patients. Uh, I think, uh, Mark, are you going to lead us off? Mark uh, is a professor of medicine in um, the uh, Department of Medicine at Stanford and a pioneer and leader in clinical trials and their design in this area, and we're very pleased to have him. Thank you very much. I see my charge this morning is to set the stage for a basic understanding of how we approach arthritis. What is arthritis? A bit about the variety of types and an understanding as to where the field has gone and what we might expect in the future. I like to start most studies about arthritis here because I think it adequately reflects just how disabling and deforming the disease can be and often the way the lay community thinks just about how devastating the disease is. But I think it's also important that we fully understand what we mean when we say arthritis. What is it we mean when we're talking about arthritis? Because eventually, and unfortunately, everyone in the room will suffer from it. And when we talk about it, what we're really describing is inflammation of the joint. Not just a single structure within the joint, but the joint itself. We recognize that there are accompanying symptoms and then signs. Those symptoms include stiffness, pain, and tenderness. Those ones are almost self-evident. But as well, they're accompanied by a number of signs, including warmth, redness, again, swelling, a decreased range of motion, and then ultimately, deformity. And of course, the outcome of chronic arthritis really is a result of an imbalance between joint destruction, a catabolic phenomenon that's going within, within us all the time, and that of tissue remodeling or reparative processes. And as we age, and after trauma, or other significant impact to the joint, that imbalance becomes more severe. Now let's think for a second about the variety of types of arthritis and how prevalent they may be. It's important to recognize that arthritis in and of itself is the most prevalent chronic disease in the United States and frankly worldwide and it is the leading cause of disability in the United States. It's characterized as you are well aware by pain and progressive physical impairment. As of the late 90s there were 43 million Americans that had formal diagnoses of arthritis and it's believed to exceed 60 million by 2020. It clearly has both psychological and social impacts and it has profound financial and economic impacts. The costs of treating the disease are profound. The costs of ignoring it are even larger. Now what about the types of arthritis? Because it's important to keep in mind that arthritis is inflammation of the joint, but there are a lot of different causes, and we characterize them slightly differently. Think for a second about dividing arthritis into two major rubrics. The first one being that of an autoimmune or an inflammatory based process. For one or more reasons, the immune system goes awry. An aberrancy in the immune system causes a variety of inflammatory cells and mediators to attack the joint and result in destruction. You can see a variety of types listed here. Juvenile chronic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and a variety of other types, psoriatic, inflammatory bowel disease associated disease, and systemic lupus. Of course, the most pervasive or most prevalent of all types, however, is that of non-autoimmune based, or what we think of as non-inflammatory disease, such as osteoarthritis. I'm going to set a stage with the next few slides to actually create an understanding for you as to what we're talking about and how disabling the diseases can be. Let's think for a second about juvenile chronic arthritis. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about youngsters, children, newborns, adolescents developing an inflammatory process that results in destruction of those joints, abnormal growth patterns that sets up disability for a lifetime. 
You may or may not be able to see this well. This is a youngster with significant inflammation and deformity within the hand. And unfortunately, this results in profound disability. And you can see the clear abnormalities evident here physically are also mimicked by the abnormal abnormalities that have taken place within the bone. And unfortunately, you cannot see it on this projection, but also within the growth plates. Once this injury has occurred, our biggest problem is figuring out how do we repair the process once it's taken hold. Now let's think about rheumatoid arthritis for a second. Just as devastating, but in a different age group. What we're talking about here is adults developing profound deformity and disability. Our goal being to prevent individuals from looking like this once they've developed the abnormality within the immune system. So I'm going to create another context for you. Let's think for a second about this patient. She presented to Stanford University in 1974. She had an initial diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis and very atypical for the time she had an original x-ray taken. And very atypical, she had serial x-rays done on a yearly basis and we can see just how the disease progresses. When she first presented, she had somewhat things that we call minor periarticular osteopenia complicated word for meaning some mild bone loss or osteoporosis around the joints. Well, this woman was treated with the best therapies of the day. We look at this patient a year later, 1975 x-rays, and there's profound swelling that's still evident. But I'm not showing it to you to show the swelling. But if you look a little bit more carefully and you hone in on just some of those individual joints, you can see that profound changes have taken place within a year. In fact, there are large pieces of bone missing. This is a hideous development, a profound problem that's taken place within a year. And unfortunately, once those changes take place, they cannot be fixed, at least not yet. And this is the same patient six years after her initial diagnosis. This is the outcome from individuals that develop a profound inflammatory process that results in deformity and destruction of the joint. And unfortunately, there's little that can be done at this point. So our goals are, are, are laudable and large, and they are to one, slow the disease, prevent the change, but ultimately design and try to figure out how we regenerate these problems once they've already taken place. So what's going on within the joint itself? Well, we start off with a normal joint, and we slowly recruit a variety of components of the immune system that ultimately progress to destroy the cartilage, the bone, the tendons, the ligaments, and the structures that provide the integrity for our joint itself. Now, if I were to take Dean Pizzo and take a small piece of the synovium out of his knee now, I'm quite confident he'd have a nice, normal-looking synovium, a few layers thick, very nice, normal, and healthy. But an individual who's got an inflammatory arthropathy has a very different pattern. They have a profound immunologic abnormality with recruitment of a variety of cell types. Hyperplasia takes place and significant angiogenesis occurs, bringing more nutrients to an area of profound abnormality. Now, this slide, I think, adequately epitomizes how we think about an inflammatory process in the immune system. It is a complex set of events providing both signaling locally and distally and it comprises the two fundamental mechanisms by which the immune system communicates. That of cytokines and that of what we call cognate cell-cell interaction. The ability of a cell to touch another cell with a ligand and a receptor and create signaling. Well, for many of you, you may not have a full or a great understanding for what cytokines are. But you should think about cytokines as the mediators of the immune system, much the way you think of hormones as the mediators of the endocrine system. Well, there are ways now, increasingly sophisticated ways after years of immunologic research, which have enabled us to target some of these mediators. In fact, through biologic production of a unique designer proteins, we can in fact block receptors, we can in fact block inflammatory cytokines by creating infusible or injectable soluble receptors that neutralize these cytokines and mediators and monoclonal antibodies that can block these cytokines and mediators. These have all resulted in significant innovation at trying to treat the disease. And we've become very adept in at least half of our patients at down-regulating or helping turn off the process. But there's another 50% of our patients that we have not been able to turn off the process. But in the greater scope of things, for once patients have occurred their injury, patients like this, 
It doesn't matter which immunologic agent I apply, I cannot fix this problem. And for the children that develop this problem, even new biologic or designer pharmacologic agents don't repair this. So what we're really talking about is innovation, regeneration, repair, and returning a homeostasis within the joint. The last disease entity I want to mention, or set the stage for, is that of the most prominent type of arthritis, and that being osteoarthritis. It is ubiquitous. We all suffer from it, and we all will have it in increasing amounts as we age. We can see hands here that clearly show abnormalities. This is not rheumatoid. This is osteoarthritis with profound bony abnormalities. This is an x-ray of a normal hand. You may not be able to see it well here. But after a few years, often when we've crossed the age of 21, we can see increasing abnormalities taking place within the small bones of the last row of knuckles and the second row of knuckles. This becomes increasingly pervasive as we age. Of course, many of you are well aware of the, of the profound abnormalities which can also occur in the lower extremities, this being the knees. Obviously, no one would want to run on these joints. Once these abnormalities have occurred, very little can be done, with the exception of some of our colleagues in orthopedic surgery who may be able to replace these joints. But ideally, I would love to put my orthopedic colleagues out of business. I would love to make joint replacement a thing of the past. Of course, many of you may be able to see this, but this is an arthroscopic view of exactly how terrible the integrity of the joint looks. This is cartilage, and it's all unraveled. It's like a ball of yarn once you clip the end off. Once it starts to unravel, it continues to unravel, and we need to come up with better ways of regenerating it. Of course, there are a variety of therapies for osteoarthritis, education, physical therapy. We even have pharmacologic interventions such as Tylenol and anti-inflammatories and interarticular injections. And how many of patients out there are particularly satisfied with these approaches? Not very many, nor should they be, because they do not change the course of the disease. We've moved towards alternative approaches and surgical correction, and then ultimately I'll touch on with what we think we should be doing for experimental options. Of course, our failure to be able to develop significant therapies for osteoarthritis has resulted in a proliferation of alternative approaches. A variety of therapies which do not fall under the same regulations as pharmaceutical agents, nor do they offer us a safety profile or an efficacy profile that we should be happy with. Of course, what we're really here to talk about is the potential for regenerative approaches to restore the balance that's normally occurring within joint damage. This joint damage is a result of an imbalance between the repair and the destruction that's taking place. Once damaged, tissue re repair becomes fundamental if we want to avoid the complications of arthritis. And our goal should be to repair tissue through regeneration, through stem cells, progenitor cell differentiation, through specific tissue patterning and architectural organization, ultimately leading to functional restoration. We should be thinking about doing this through stem cells. These stem cells circulate and migrate to tissues, and they can promote repair at injured sites. As you're well aware, they are multipotent, they have self-renewal capacity, and they have multi-lineage differentiation. And we recognize that the inherited and genetic alterations in these tissue resident adult stem cells, those that are residing within the joint, become abnormal. And through a lifespan, they lead to loss of function. Tissue-specific stem cells can repopulate within tissues. We know this already. They can reside there and they can regenerate damaged tissue after an injury. There are a variety of different types of stem cells, as you're, stem cells, as you're aware. And to avoid the political debate, you should be well aware that it's possible to do things with stem cells that do not involve embryos, both fetal, amniotic, umbilical, as well as adult stem cells. These can be found in adult tissue. They participate in tissue homeostasis, remodeling, and repair. And we can specifically even be looking at resident adult stem cells, such as mesenchymal stem cells, that can be used to differentiate into bone, cartilage, muscle, fat, and neuronal cells. And they could potentially be manipulated in the future to regenerate and repair patients that have arthritis. So what is our hope for the future here? Well, it's joint and tissue repair through the recruitment of resident endogenous stem cells to the site of damage, activation and repair in vivo in the live human being. This can be achieved through controlled release of specific morphogens, stimulants that would stimulate 
and help these stem cells differentiate. And then also through the use of what we would consider bioactive scaffolds, an ability to help create and structure the architecture within the joint. The alternative here is to expand bone marrow derived stem cells and then intraarticularly through an injection place them into the joint with appropriate pharmacologic manipulation. These are not things on the horizon, these are things that we should be doing now. The technology exists and we should find ways of trying to make end-stage arthritis a thing of the past and try and provide hope to all of those groups, the juveniles, the adults with autoimmune diseases, and the remainder of the Western society and worldwide that will suffer from degenerative arthritis such as osteoarthritis.